Today at the National Press Club, Cobble Cobble Woman, Professor Megan Davis and Aliawara Woman, Pat Anderson, architects of the Uluru Statement from the Heart. The Uluru Statement launched a landmark campaign for Indigenous recognition and a voice to Parliament. Megan Davis and Pat Anderson with today's National Press Club address. Hello and welcome to the National Press Club for in Canberra for today's Westpac address. I first wish to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the lands we are meeting on, the Ngunnawal and Ngambri people, who are the traditional custodians of this land on which we gather. We would like to pay our respects to elders past and present, as well as the many First Nations people attending this event. Always was, always will be Aboriginal land. My name is Anna Henderson, SBS Chief Political Correspondent and Director here at the Press Club. Our guests today are Professor Megan Davis and Pat Anderson AO, two of three First Nations leaders along with Noel Pearson, accepting the 2021 Sydney Peace Prize for the Uluru Statement from the Heart, with their address entitled Uluru Statement from the Heart. Professor Davis is a Cobble Cobble woman, Pro Vice Chancellor, Society and Pro Professor of Law at the University of New South Wales. She is a renowned constitutional lawyer and public law expert focusing on the advocacy of First Nations people. She is a co-chair of the Uluru Dialogue and the Balnaves Chair of Constitutional Law. She's currently a member of the United Nations Human Rights Council's expert mechanism on the rights of Indigenous people. And this year she was appointed by the government to the referendum working group and the referendum engagement group. And joining her is Pat Anderson AO, an Aliawara woman known nationally and internationally as a powerful advocate for the health of Australia's First Nations people. She has extensive experience in Indigenous health, including community development, policy formation and research ethics. She has served as a co-chair of the Referendum Council and she currently serves as co-chair of the Uluru Dialogue. And this year she was appointed by the government to the Referendum Working Group and the Referendum Engagement Group. Now you can follow today's conversation on Twitter. It's at Press Club Ost or hashtag NPC. Please welcome Megan Davis and Pat Anderson. Thank you, Anna, for that introduction. On behalf of Pat Anderson and Noel Pearson and myself, I'd like to say what an honour it is to be named co-recipients of the Sydney Peace Prize for the Uluru Statement from the Heart. The Uluru Statement from the Heart is the shared endeavour of many minds and many hands. And to that end, I want to begin by acknowledging the presence here today of some of the men and women of the First Nations Regional Dialogues. And in fact, there's so many, it'd be great if you could all just quickly stand so people can see who some of the faces are um, who participated in the First Nations Regional Dialogues. Don't be shy. I also note the preponderance of Aboriginal women in attendance, the quiet work and advocacy of uh, women um, has sustained this movement for change since the Uluru Statement was issued to the Australian people five years ago. It has been led by women um, and we are really honoured that um, a woman, Minister Linda Burney, will take that forward. But I do want to acknowledge um, Pat Anderson for her inimitable leadership style, her formidable leadership. If it wasn't for Pat, we would never have successfully run the Uluru Dialogues or got the consensus at The Rock in 2017. So I wanted to acknowledge Pat. I think I speak for Pat and Noel when I say that the work of the subcommittee of the Referendum Council was the privilege of a lifetime and the work since to carry the mandate of the Uluru Statement to fruition. Today my comments will be pretty kind of simple and straightforward. Pat and I thought we would take this opportunity of the Sydney Peace Prize to speak about the process of the First Nations Regional Dialogues. Um, I think that's really important to convey to the Australian people about how important and generous 
um, the Uluru Statement is. And then I want to speak about where we are now in terms of the political cycle and the move toward a referendum. The First Nations regional dialogues uh, were conducted under the auspices of the Referendum Council. They were the first of its kind since the Australian constitutional order commenced in 1901. Many Australians would know that First Nations were excluded uh, from the drafting of the Australian Constitution and, of course, in the text of the Australian Constitution. Therefore, this process, the dialogue process, was unprecedented in our nation's history. And of the National Constitutional Convention held at Uluru in 2017, it is the first time a constitutional convention has been convened with uh, and for First Nations people. Thus, the dialogue process and the Uluru Statement from the Heart is a profound response to the historical exclusion of our people from Australia's constitutional system. The many reports and processes that followed uh, uh, after Prime Minister Julia Gillard's expert panel inevitably led us to the Referendum Council. This is because of the proclivity of retail Australian politics for minimalism and symbolism when it comes to Indigenous matters. It meant that a small group of political players were proffering a form of recognition that few First Nations peoples sought. Indeed, the Uluru Statement from the Heart and the dialogue process universally rejected symbolism as an acceptable form of constitutional recognition alone. Indeed, what's interesting, having served on the expert panel and the Referendum Council, is that there is an alignment between non-Indigenous Australians and First Nations peoples in terms of their desire that this reform is not tokenistic, that this reform is not symbolic, but that it must be substantive. It must change people's lives on the ground, otherwise why go to a referendum? So this is why a new process was started in 20, late 2015 by Turnbull. Prior to that, leaders from across Australia had issued what's known as the Kirribilli Statement. This was at a meeting in mid-2015, um, a meeting between Prime Minister Tony Abbott, opposition leader Bill Shorten, and First Nations leaders from across the country. The problem had emerged uh, in our communities since the expert panel um, in relation to the recognition project in that the nation had forgotten to go out and ask communities themselves what meaningful recognition might mean to them. So the process of the council was in some ways retrofitting First Nations input into the recognition project. The Gillard expert panel that I also served on was a panel of experts and lawyers and politicians, and we chose the options for recognition. But recognition is a complex legal and political concept. Its dictionary meaning does mean acknowledgement, but it can mean many things in a legal and political context. It can mean symbolic acknowledgement. It can mean a preamble. But it also means substantive change, substantive reform to power relations. Recognition in a legal and political and constitutional sense sits on a recognition spectrum. At one end of that spectrum is what we call weak recognition. It's known as weak recognition because it doesn't compel the state to do anything. It doesn't stop or prohibit the state from doing something. It is rather a statement of fact. It is symbolic. At the, under, at the other end of the spectrum, which is really where First Nations reside, is uh, concrete or substantive recognition. There's many, many mechanisms that represent substantive recognition. It can be something like the Sami parliaments. It can be something like designated parliamentary seats. It can be treaty. It can be a voice to parliament. 
The problem in 2015 was that the public discussion in Australia rarely rose above the dictionary meaning of recognition, which is acknowledgement. So this was very unsettling for communities because in the absence of a very clear and substantive model or proposal for recognition, advocacy for recognition was being conflated with a very minimal symbolic form of recognition. So it was that the opportunity arose with Malcolm Turnbull setting up the Referendum Council. The Council's members accepted that not enough had been done to engage the First Nations communities on the question of the form of recognition. So we were then tasked with the job of consulting with our people in an environment where consultation had become a dirty word. At the time that we prepared and started researching and developing the dialogues in late 2015 and 2016, things were not going well in our communities. Post-abolition of ATSIC, the bureaucracy at every level of government had slid into a habit of what mob called the tick and flick consultation, superficial consultation with our people. Moreover, a Commonwealth policy called the Indigenous Advancement Strategy had been introduced. It had decimated the Aboriginal sector. The IAS was a key influence on decision making during the dialogues. Communities had had vital services stripped from them and they were made to jump through burdensome bureaucratic hurdles without recourse to review or support and then later witnessed vital funding earmarked for Indigenous Affairs programs granted at the Minister's discretion to non-Indigenous organisations. The voices of the First Nations regional dialogues on this matter was vindicated later in 2017 by the Australian National Audit Office, who delivered a scathing uh, report on the government's mismanagement of the IAS in their report especially with respect to grants management and grants administration. The IAS, um, however, has been a much bigger issue than just the maladministration of public funds. It was born out of an absence of authoritative Indigenous voices and informed by a bureaucratic and public policy rationalisation that was entirely disconnected from the reality of the lives that First Nations peoples live. So you can imagine that when Pat, Noel, I and the team went out to consult with communities in dialogues on constitutional recognition, they were not in the mood to discuss constitutional reform. But these conditions are important to set out in an environment where discussion of the voice since the Albanese government's commitment to a referendum is being conducted without any real discussion and understanding of the need and the exigency of a voice. There is an understandable impatience for detail on voice, but very little scrutiny on why it is needed or why people want a voice. The discussion is divorced from the policy settings that plague our people's lives on the ground and subjugate our voice to the bureaucracy. The discussions and the opportunity of constitutional recognition were inextricably connected or tied to the reality of people's lives on the ground. It's why the reform proposed will provide an upfront political empowerment. It's tactile, it's pragmatic, it empowers our people. So we set about designing a deliberative process that was structured and would be replicated precisely in every site and every location. So we started off with 32 dialogues based on the ATSIC regions, but with the funding that we were given, we had to only run 12. So we designed it in a way that we would have a sample of representatives, because we cannot consult every single First Nations person or community. And the sample of representatives needed to be chosen by local Indigenous community organisations for the outcome to have legitimacy. We developed and road tested over 2016 a very tightly structured, intensive civics program, a program for the assessment of legal options and also political assessment of the reforms that 
Prime Minister Turnbull and the opposition leader Shorten gave us permission to take out to communities. Those options were the expert panel options, but they agreed to the voice to parliament and agreement making as well. The process was based on a number of processes that we researched. Some of it was from deliberative democratic processes and other constitutional reform processes internationally, such as Ireland. And a substantive amount of it was modelled partly on the constitutional centenary foundation framework that was utilised here in Australia through the 1990s to encourage debate on constitutional issues in local communities and schools. It was adapted to suit the needs of the First Nations regional di uh, dialogues, but the characteristics remain the same as the constitutional centenary foundation model. That are four, these are four key characteristics. Impartiality, accessibility of relevant information, open and constructive dialogue, and mutually agreed and owned outcomes. If I can just say a few things about each of those points, because they're really critical to understanding how the dialogues functioned. Impartiality was really important in that we wanted to avoid the operation of groupthink. Too many meetings are held where the loudest in the room shouts down others and people don't get the opportunity to participate. So it was structured in a way that you had breakout groups um, balanced with plenary groups um, so that we had the opportunity for people who were shy, introverted, didn't want to talk publicly, a lot of women who wanted to go into groups where they could discuss really substantive matters without being shouted down by any groups that might seek to push a pre, um, uh, an option that they preferred. So the mitigation of groupthink was a really key point in, in the design. Accessibility of relevant information was important because of the many, many languages that our people speak. So if I reflect on um, the Ross River Dialogue, which was hosted by the Central Land Council, there were four different interpreters in the room um, and it, was, it, it did make the dialogue much longer um, to deliver. But we flew in a week early to meet with the Alice Springs Interpreter Service. We ran through the whole three days. They worked out ways that we could change our language. They worked out ways that they would translate the information. And so it was really important that every single location was able to access the information before them. The last characteristic I wanted to touch upon was mutually agreed and owned outcomes. This is a really key thing about the consensus at Uluru. The record of meeting was something that everybody in the dialogue had to endorse. No one left that meeting until they had signed the record of meeting. And that's because the record of meeting captures the tensions, the disagreements and, and the agreement. So everything was captured. And people had to sign off on that because our communities don't all agree on everything all the time. Um, and there's many blackfellas in the room who are shaking and nodding their heads. We don't agree. And so the whole purpose of the process was to get to a, to a point where we could agree on something. So the delegates to each regional dialogue were selected according to a criteria. And that criteria was to be applied by a, a, a local organisation that would run the dialogue. 60% had to come from First Nations cultural authority or traditional owner groups, our, our old people. That was really key because we really wanted the decision making to be robust at the end and to be really anchored in the way in which our communities make decisions. 20% of the places in the dialogue were for local community organisations on the ground. So not national peaks, but communities who are working in, sorry, organisations who are working in communities on the ground. And 20% um, involved key individuals from the, the region. We spent 2016 seeking permission from traditional owners, peak bodies and other leaders on the method 
So we would travel out, show them what we were going to do, they would give us feedback, critique, and then we would modify it until we came to a, a, a method that we were happy with and community was happy with. And we ran three major meetings in 2016. One in Broome with traditional owners, one on Thursday Island with National Peaks, and one in Melbourne with key leaders from across the country. So we took all of that and we trialled the dialogue then at Melbourne Law School. Um, and it was at the trial that we really discovered things that worked, things that, that didn't work, so we tinkered with the process and we started the dialogues in December 2016. At the Melbourne Law School trial dialogue, though, we discovered a num number of things. One was um, we banned facilitators, so facilitation. It had to be led by local people. Um, and those local people in the dialogues we called working group leaders. Um, who became, became famously known as the Wiggles. But they were the people in the dialogues that knew everybody's name and, and came to Melbourne, learnt the process, and then they would come to the dialogue before so that they could run the dialogue that came after. We also um, banned significant leaders from the movement because of their cynicism about government and the country changing. And that wasn't great for a law reform proposal, like a law reform process. Um, so we wouldn't allow many of them to speak, but we also wouldn't allow people with a voice. So if you had one of those badges where you get into Parliament House and you regularly lobby in the halls of Canberra with politicians, that the, the dialogues were not for you. Um, if you were CEO of really peak national bodies, the dialogues, you weren't invited. It had to be people that were actually genuinely voiceless. And the other group, and I apologise to the Law Council of Australia, the other group we banned were lawyers. <laughs> um, except for myself. Um, <laughs> lawyers, <laughs> lawyers um, they tend to be know-it-alls. And, um, <laughs> and in this process, um, we would have lawyers who'd studied you know, constitutional law in 1980, and they'd take everybody down a particular pathway, and it was totally disastrous, so we just, we banned all the lawyers. Um, and so from there, we ended up on a process that we then took out. We got approval from uh, Turnbull and Shorten, and um, they approved it on the 20th of October 2016, and out we went to communities to run the dialogues. We engaged the Australian Institute of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Studies, IATSIS, to provide assistance in delivering the logistics and supporting delegates to attend. So it wasn't me, Noel, Pat, um, uh, Delassa, it wasn't a top-down process, but rather IATSIS helped us engage local communities who would decide who attended, so it was a bottom-up process. Um, so we weren't involved in that logistical aspect of it. So the First Nations Regional Dialogues were convened in the following locations in Hobart by the Tasmanian Aboriginal Corporation, in Broome by the Kimberley Land Council, um, in Dubbo by the New South Wales Aboriginal Land Council, and they also hosted the Sydney Dialogue. The Darwin Dialogue was hosted by the National, uh, sorry, the Northern Land Council. Perth was hosted by the South West Aboriginal Land and Sea Council. Melbourne by the Federation of Victorian Traditional Owners. The Big Cairns Dialogue was hosted by the North Queensland Land Council. The Ross River Dialogue was hosted by the Central Land Council. The Adelaide Dialogue was hosted by the Aboriginal Land Rights Movement. Brisbane was hosted by a number of Brisbane-based organisations. And Thursday Island was hosted by the Torres Shire Council. And we also ran a truncated version of the dialogue down here in Canberra, um, which was hosted by the United Ngunnawal Elders Council. And then finally, the National Constitutional Convention was held at Uluru from the 23rd to the 26th of May, and then, of course, the Uluru Statement was issued on the 27th of May. We say the integrity of the process is evidenced in the fact that the exhaustive deliberations and the informed participation led to consensus at Uluru. The outcome captured in the Uluru Statement from the Heart was a testament to the efficacy of the structured process that produced a historic consensus coalescing around a constitutional mechanism that compels the state to listen to our voice. The proposal for a voice to parliament is quite a common mechanism globally. It comes in many forms, 
but it's aimed at enhancing the participation of Indigenous peoples within a democratic system in the decision making of the state so that the decisions are better quality, they're better informed and resources are properly allocated and targeted to outcomes because it's communities themselves that know better than anyone else what communities need. The voice was a sequence. I know this has been the subject of some debate. The sequencing was the subject of very diligent consideration in all of the dialogues that led to Uluru. During the dialogues, delegates engaged in a very comprehensive discussion of the political and legal reasoning and logic of the voice first, treaty second, sequencing. But the opportunity on the table for us in 2017 was constitutional recognition and treaty is not constitutional. On the agreement making matter, there was a lot of fatigue across the continent with agreement making. Many discussed also the acute impact that native title had had on their communities and their lives. In many communities, native title processes had ripped communities apart and members of families and communities were not talking to each other. In fact, people spoke very strongly about the need for dispute resolution services in communities. People were also very fatigued by litigation. They're exhausted. And many signalled that they could not overcome the power imbalance between community and the state. So if, if communities um, are exhausted by native title, how was it that they could treat with the state? The threshold treaty question is who to treaty with? And I think you've seen the logic play out in Victoria where they have set up a voice before they've gone on to treaty. And the sequence does matter because there's no treaty in the world that's required a truth-telling process first, that's required a truth commission first. When talking about truth-telling in communities, the dialogues weren't talking about truth commissions. They were talking about the activity that they undertake already and they want to undertake more in terms of their place in Australian history and Aboriginal history. They spoke about activities in their own local communities, the activities they undertake with local historical societies, local libraries, local government, smoking ceremonies and healing ceremonies with the many descendants of um, people whose families participated in the killing times in the frontier wars, who are seeking out mob to, to heal their families for what happened. So there's truth-telling activity all over this country and the idea was that the Makarata Commission could capture that. Because one of the very strong and fierce um, statements made by the dialogues was that they choose when their stories go up to a commission, not vice versa, that it has to be bottom up. Truth commissions are also a kind of confection of the transitional justice theory and practice that dominates the world. It was developed in the heyday of that reconciliation era of the 1990s where you had these Latin American countries emerging from dictatorship. And to make that transition from dictatorship to liberal democratic governance under the rule of law, they needed a process. That's where these truth commissions come from. The practice was developed and is now heavily pushed by the United Nations as one that aids peace, peace in post-conflict communities and allows theoretically allows the perpetrator and the victim to live peacefully um, under the rule of law. But any cursory study of these across the world, and with my UN hat on, these, are, these commissions are done um, very frequently in countries with significant Indigenous populations, any cursory study will show that um, they never result in people being satisfied. I also think we can't conflate the unfinished business of dispossession in this country with the modern confection of transitional justice. I'm not sure you can confuse the two, but I do think further discussion is required with our communities on the ground in a very transparent way about how they see truth-telling happening in their communities. But there's one rule of thumb. Our rights are inherent rights and you don't delay rights like something like the voice, 
you don't delay treaty for a truth commission. They are inherent rights. You don't need a truth commission to set the framework for that. So the proposal voice Makarata was viewed by our people as a roadmap to peace. Many Australians come to me over the past five years and say it's a very, very generous offer, and it is. Our people didn't have to participate in those dialogues, but they did. They spent the first day unloading on government policy, like the Indigenous Advancement Strategy, child removals, youth suicide, youth detention, and about our exclusion from Australian history and the need for truth-telling. But once they did that, they turned up on Saturday with their sleeves rolled up and got to work. And they came up with a solution to a number of constitutional problems that no constitutional lawyer had thought of before, the dialogues. That's the magic of trusting your communities with decision making and change. The people in the dialogues did not want to be politicians. They did not want to be professional politicians. These are men and women who stay in community, live on country and choose to serve their communities for their whole lives. But they don't have a voice. The argument that's going around at the moment that somehow in 2022 we have you know, X number of politicians and it obviates the need for a voice is a curious one, particularly since the argument holds no weight in, say, 2032 or 2042 when we might have no politicians. Every working group in the dialogues endorsed the voice to parliament as a reform priority. They discussed how the voice would operate as a front end political limit on the parliament's powers to pass laws that affect First Nations peoples. And they appreciated that this political empowerment model would hopefully achieve better design policies in the future. I want to turn now to where we are in the process. On election night, the Prime Minister uh, promised to implement the Uluru Statement from the heart in full. And that night, um, our hearts were full. Much has been made of the Prime Minister's speech at Gama when he released a draft form of words for the nation to discuss and give input into. It's not set in stone, but it's a good beginning. In substance, implementing the Uluru Statement from the heart means delivering a voice that is capable of the following. Reflecting the aspirations of the First Nations people in the dialogues and at Uluru. Getting First Nations a seat at the table, a constitutionally secured and insured seat at the table. The constitutional amendment must be legally sound, drafted in a constitutionally prudent manner, anticipating possible future issues that might narrow the, oper the operation of the voice and undermine its ability to deliver on its promise. The constitutional amendment must be capable of delivering a successful referendum with the status and functions that will provide meaningful and powerful representation for First Nations voice as a vehicle for political participation. It was always understood that we would require ongoing work on the constitutional drafting stage to find a constitutionally effective way to meet those challenges. An amendment that compels the state to give our people a voice. And we welcome the Prime Minister uh, opening with a draft proposal to start that discussion. And that process shouldn't be used to hollow out the meaning and the intent which we sometimes see in commentary of political pundits. The political reality is that Australians won't accept changing the constitution unless they can be sure that the change is worth making and that they can be confident about its impact. The task of the drafting process must be to meet that challenge head on and not kid ourselves with the false pragmatism of a hollowed out voice that will be rejected. Also, there is clearly detail to come on the voice that the government will prepare but that detail is led by the work and the words of the men and women in the Uluru Dialogues. What did they say about voice? They spoke about many things. They spoke to representation as nations, as First Nations. 
And they also said that there was no single existing entity that represented their voice. This is an important point. They were critical of peak bodies and other organisations who purport to speak on their behalf, but are never accountable back to community. So the most prominent part of the dialogues was this discourse of two-way accountability. The accountability of these organisations to community and the accountability of Parliament to First Nations. There is much detail from the dialogues, the Lisa and Dodson report and aspects of the Langton and Kalmar report that provide meat on the bones and will allow Australians to vote in an informed way. Many Indigenous peoples all over the country trusted the process enough to give up a weekend to learn about the Constitution and participate in dialogues about what change and recognition means to them. With purpose and armed with civics education, legal and political information, it is they who formed the Uluru Consensus Voice Makarata. This has been a monumental contribution to the democratic life of the Australian state. The First Nations have asked for the constitution to be amended to compel the parliament to hear First Nations voices and views before making decisions about law and policy. Such a reform would align with international best practice in pursuit of self-determination for First Peoples, helping to fulfil Australia's obligations under the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples and other human rights instruments. It is a constitutional innovation that is in keeping with the culture of Australia's constitution. It would be a reform of which Australia could be proud, knowing that given the wrongdoing of the past, pausing to hear First Nations voices before making decisions is the least that we can do. To wrap it up, the Uluru Statement is an invitation. It was issued as an invitation. We did not hand it to politicians. It's an invitation to the Australian people. The statement is a logic about why we need a voice. The purpose of the invitation was to avoid the tribalism of politics, to avoid retail Australian politics that has got us where we are. The Uluru Statement was not about left and right camps. It was never about ideological set pieces or ideological battles. It's about us together as the Australian people. And I say this not as a Pollyanna, we are no Pollyannas, we're not naive about politics. Indeed, the whole idea is to remove our issues from the realm of politics, party politics, so we're no longer a political football. Constitutional reform is vital for the future of, the, of Indigenous Australia. The utilitarian ethic of liberal democracies like Australia means that our political and legal concerns are always dwarfed. 2% of the Australian population are tasked with the epic struggle of convincing Australian parliaments of the utility of passing legislative matters or adopting policies that benefit Aboriginal people alone. When such measures and policies have been taken, it's often been through the use of special measures under the Racial Discrimination Act, which permit the state to effectively discriminate in favour of Aboriginal people in order to achieve equality. However, special measures are only meant for a temporary period and are supposed to cease once the objectives have been fulfilled. And even when more permanent measures are put in place, the Native Title Act or the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Heritage Protection Act, History demonstrates how easily these rights are abrogated and repealed. For these reasons, constitutional reform remains the central pursuit of what Aboriginal people called unfinished business. And despite everything that has happened to our people, as Noel Pearson referred to us in his Boyer lectures as the great unloved, from the invasion to the frontier wars, to the killing times, the protection era, to the forced assimilation era, to self-determination, to the non-self-determination and unfreedom of the past two decades. Despite everything, we responded with a statement of love. When people got upset at the dialogues, we would say, 
Law reform is about imagination. You must suspend your disbelief that this country cannot change. Against all the evidence, you must imagine that this country can be better. Imagine that this nation can change. And so many in the dialogues understood this because they are the children of the 1967 warriors. And we had many of the 1967 warriors in the dialogues. And they are not at all intimidated by the referendum record because as they said, we won in 1967 and we can do it again. They believe so strongly in the goodwill of the Australian people. Even so, Pat and I vividly recall the morning after the 2019 federal election when some of our old people from the dialogues and the National Convention rang us to say, take me off your list. Take me off the mailing list. Take me off the Friday night Zoom, for my heart cannot take this. They had so much hope and felt that they would never see the Uluru Statement from the Heart achieved. The Uluru Statement from the Heart is in fact a sign of friendship. Many of our old people are dying and they are acutely aware that Australia approaches the most difficult phase of human existence in global warming and climate change. Our old people said that enough is enough and they want peace for country. In most of the dialogues, the word reconciliation was contested because it's a word that presupposes a prior relationship. They said the word was wrong because we have never met. We have never met. And this was why they issued the Uluru Statement from the Heart to the Australian people. It is an invitation to all Australians to meet with us at The Rock. Come meet with us and walk with us. And so many Australians have accepted the Uluru Statement from the heart, and we thank you. We have a national database of over 6,000 organisations who have signed up to walk with us over five years. And it traverses all sectors of the Australian people in all its light and colour. So to conclude, I will read that invitation from our old people to you, the Australian people, the invitation that I first read five years ago, an invitation to the Australian people. We gathered at the 2017 National Constitutional Convention, coming from all points of the southern sky, make this statement from the heart. Our Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander tribes were the first sovereign nations of the Australian continent and its adjacent islands and possessed it under our own laws and customs. This our ancestors did according to the reckoning of our culture from the creation, according to the common law from time immemorial and according to science more than 60,000 years ago. This sovereignty is a spiritual notion, the ancestral tie between the land or Mother Nature and the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples who were born therefrom remain attached thereto and must one day return thither to be united with our ancestors. This link is the basis of the ownership of the soil or better of sovereignty. It has never been ceded or extinguished and coexists with the sovereignty of the Crown. How could it be otherwise that peoples possessed a land for 60 millennia and this sacred link disappears from world history in merely the last 200 years? With substantive constitutional change and structural reform, we believe this ancient sovereignty can shine through as a fuller expression of Australia's nationhood. Proportionally, we are the most incarcerated people on the planet. We are not innately criminal people. Our children are aliened from their families at unprecedented rates. This cannot be because we have no love for them. And our youth languish in detention in obscene numbers. They should be our hope for the future. 
These dimensions of our crisis tell plainly the structural nature of our problem. This is the torment of our powerlessness. We seek constitutional reforms to empower our people and take a rightful place in our own country. When we have power over our destiny, our children will flourish. They will walk in two worlds and their culture will be a gift to the country. We call for the establishment of a First Nations voice enshrined in the Constitution. Makarata is the culmination of our agenda, the coming together after a struggle. It captures our aspirations for a fair and truthful relationship with the people of Australia and a better future for our children based on justice and self-determination. We seek a Makarata Commission to supervise a process of agreement making between governments and First Nations and truth-telling about our history. In 1967, we were counted. In 2017, we seek to be heard. We leave base camp and start our trek across this vast country. And we invite you to walk with us in a movement of the Australian people for a better future. Thank you. Well, Megan, thank you so much for your very powerful address and for restating uh, that, that statement from the heart uh, here at the Press Club. Pat, while well, Megan's possibly catching her breath after really spelling out so much detail and so much that has already been done, I think the question possibly is in terms of where this goes next and what obligations the government in particular has to make good on, on its words really, what do you think that the federal government needs to do uh, in the coming months to actually prosecute this uh, and, and to explain it to the broader Australian public who may still not be as clear about what they'd be voting on. True. The government has set up two working groups. One's called, uh, that'll talk to uh, Patrick and Linda and the other politicians on the go government side and give advice, direction, what we might do, how it might work. And the other group is what's called, and it's a smaller group, there's another larger group called engagement. And part of their work will be how we are going to engage uh, with the, pop the whole community over the next little while. There's no date set uh, for when, the, when it is going to be held. There's lots of, uh, the Prime Minister has said, as you remember, that it'll be in his first, his first term. Um, there's a whole lot of dates that have been put around. The latest one we've heard is like October 2023. So there's a very fine line between getting everybody ready for a referendum and when is it time to go, and there's definitely a time to go. There's no doubt about that. We can't leave this hanging around for too long, otherwise we will lose momentum. I've been around a really long time working in this space, and this is the best opportunity we've ever had. So it's time to go soon. So someone will make, probably the Prime Minister will make the judgment when that time is right, but there is definitely a time to go. Because if we go into the next term of the election, what have you, we've lost, in my view, we've lost. We would have lost the momentum and the government and all of us will get sidetracked by a whole lot of other things. The world is changing as we speak, like warp speed changing every day. So, it's, so they have got these groups set up who will give them advice on how to proceed and Megan and I sit on both of them. Um, so, and he has in the budget allocated some money for the Electoral Commission to, because voting uh, public is really low in our communities. Mm. So they get some money for that. They've also uh, put some money aside for the planning for a, uh, for a Makarata. So planning, not to have one, there's a bit of confusion there. Everyone's been missing the word planning. Mm. So they are moving as quickly, I think, as they can. Yeah. There's a whole lot of work to do. We have to work out how we're going to educate um, the Australian population. Uh, there's a whole lot of toing and froing um, about that, but we need to get out there um, fairly soon. Most people don't understand what you've just heard from Megan. Um, so that's another issue as well uh, to what we're, what we're on about. A lot of misinformation. 
Can I make a plea while I've got this, the microphone? Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> you have to inform yourselves. It doesn't matter in the end which way you vote, but do it with, a, do it with some consciousness, with some heart and with some intellect. You know, think about it. Is this going to work or isn't it going to work? Or is this the right thing to do? How do I feel about this? You know, there comes a time when you're in the ballot box yourself, but it's just you and your conscience. So get yourself ready for that time in your life because all of us over 18, this is probably one of the biggest things we're ever going to do. And it is, and it can. I don't like to get into this sort of language that we get accused of. It's all sort of soft or what have you. It can change. You have to, you have to reimagine, as Megan has asked. You have to reimagine who we could be, who we should be. So you have to suspend that kind of, oh, you know, we're, Australians are really bad. Oh, it's never going to work. It's, you know, terrible idea. You have to sort of get over that and in, try to imagine what we could and should be. But great potential in this country. Uh, and now the, the, I think the time is right. The government is trying. They've got these committees of people here in the room who are involved in that as well. So we'll see. There's a lot of work to do and we've got to do it quickly. Mm. But the Prime Minister is still holding the line that he, when he announced you know, that he would implement the earlier statement in full at the election when he was first. First words he said as a new Prime Minister, which was very, uh, let's see. You know, we've all been disappointed before, but so far, it's looking okay. Well, let's go to our first question from the working press. John Paul Janke. Great to see you both again. Um, my question really is about uh, elected structures. Um, we've heard commentary about previous elected bodies like ATSIC, the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Commission, characterised as corrupt or mismanaged as a way of really discrediting the voice. Now, while it's a throwaway line, of course, it's without substantial clarification, it seems to be generally accepted now that elected structures have been corrupt and mismanaged. Do you think that there's a widespread misunderstanding of the actual roles and responsibilities of Indigenous elected bodies? And in, so, in asking that, what do you think were the major achievements or benefits of elected structures like ATSIC? Do you want me to go first? Then? You go yeah. first. We're both going to answer. Yeah. I think it's going to go first. <laughs> yeah, no, it's... Um, so I, I did my PhD partly on ATSIC. I mean, one of the frust... I also used to work there as a junior lawyer before I moved on. Um, one of the frustrating things about the kind of stock standard narrative that everybody tells themselves about ATSIC is um, that uh, there's been virtually no kind of academic empirical, you know, empirical study of what ATSIC did or didn't do. Um, and so I hear that language of corruption and, and nepotism, but there's nothing really being set out um, to explain what that means. So is it, was it at a regional level? Was it at a national level? Um, there's not a lot of precision around what, what people say ATSIC did or didn't do, which is a shame because it was a big yeah. public administration innovation in the world. Um, its creation and what it did, you know, is imbued in the Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peace. So the drip is really interesting because so many Australians contributed to the drafting of it, including ATSIC. So a lot of those structures around political participation are, are informed by that. But since its adoption, Australia has regressed from the, the actual declaration. Um, community control is imbued in that declaration as well. So there, there's, um, there are a lot of achievements of, of ATSIC. Um, you know, I talk to people my age around the country about the opportunities we were given um, over the course of our careers, and all of them came from an association with ATSIC. Um, I know when I went to Canberra, there were these incredible Aboriginal women who just really nurtured my professional career, like Jackie Oakley, who's, you know, over in WA, but was the senior exec, Sonia Smallacombe, these amazing women that would come and mentor you and provide you with opportunities. I think for women, um, it was really important. But having said that, there's an Australian National Audit Office that then went and audited whether ATSIC was meeting the needs of women and found from talking to women that it didn't and then had a whole raft of really fascinating recommendations about what should be implemented into the structure to, to make things better for female voice. And I suppose the point I'm trying to make is there's a whole lot of work around this 
that it just escapes any analysis or scrutiny when there is public kind of focus on ATSIC, what it did and didn't do. But when we ran the dialogues, and I'll hand it to Pat, we heard nothing but an overwhelming um, sentiment from people on the ground that their lives had been very, very difficult since ATSIC was abolished, that it was ATSIC regional councils and local people that they went to when they needed help, particularly people in regional and remote communities, and that that bush infrastructure, when it was stripped, um, mm. contributed to the deterioration of those communities. Um, and it contributes to people's feelings of voicelessness and powerlessness. Yeah. So, actually, there was a, f in the dialogues, people actually said that, you know, they'd been shamed into not talking about ATSIC and not talking about the merits of ATSIC because of these, these myth myths that you were talking about. Um, that's not to say it didn't have problems, but ATSIC was never not open to that. There was a massive ATSIC review done yeah. at the tail end towards it being ab abolished really amazing ideas, including from Jackie Huggins, about how to include women and gender within the framework of that institution. And instead, they just abolish, abolished it. But I'll hand it to you mm -hmm. if you've got something to add. Just a little bit. I'll just follow on um, from that. In the dialogues, people talked about there's been this huge gap. There's been We have no place where we can go and have conversation, whereas at ADSIC, we did. Um, I was running a community control organisation in, in Dan Ladulba, the local health service, and we were fighting with that sick all the time. But the <laughs> doors were always open. We could go in there and, you know, take our aunties and everything and sort of stand over them. And, uh, and it was really good. It was very... A um, lot of interaction with people um, on the ground. And people miss that, and people, that said time and time again uh, as we went to the dialogues that people miss that sick. And we have... And it's true. In the political arena, we haven't had a voice. We've got no one place, one place to go to. There's been this huge vacuum since ATSIC got um, uh, abolished, like it did, and that was another reason why people were talking at the at the uh, uh, regional dialogues. The only way we can get any progress here is to use their law, their big law. We got to go there because everything else has. I've sat on a million committees, as we all have, you know, most of my life. And they said, we've got to go to the big... And the big law is the Constitution. So we, we use their law to get what we want, to convince them to help us. And, and, they're, they're, and they talked about ATSIC in the, an afternoon. The current minister just signed it away, as it's done with all the other organisations that we've set up. NACC, NAEC, and I've sat on most of them. They all just disappeared in a puff of smoke. That's got to stop. We have quite a few members of the working press here to, <laughs> to ask questions. We'll get through as many as we can. Next is Laura Tingle. Thanks, Anna. Thanks to you both. Um, I wanted to follow up a, a bit of the theme of your answers and uh, to John Paul's question there. Um, beyond ATSIC, uh, you talked, Megan, about the two-way dialogue. And I suppose um, I'm just interested in the extent to which constitutional recognition of the voice uh, creates a body which captures all of those um, uh, c consultations and feeds them back into communities. And I wonder the extent to which uh, the, as you also talked about the degradation of uh, basically black governance over the last 20 years, really going back to John Howard, the d demolition of all of those bodies, um, their, uh, their sort of sidelining. How important is it, uh, apart from the constitutional questions, that uh, government actually has a really good look at what's happened to all of those community organisations and looks at funding them and recognising them in the voice process. Yeah, um, so on the first question, what was it about again? Um, <laughs> it was... It, it, it's about... Oh, um, Sorry, it was about... Um, the accountability mechanism. Accountability. So, yeah. I mean, I would... Ma I'll, making the voice uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, the, the centrepiece that can report to government on what's happened to these bodies, apart from anything else. Yeah, I mean, part of that will be, I suppose, imbued in the amendment, but a lot will be set out in legislation. So in the APSIC Act, for example, there was a recall mechanism, meaning people could recall members if they weren't representing them properly. 
And the recall mechanism was really supported in the dialogues, the idea that if someone wasn't coming back to community, wasn't coming back to mob and saying, well, this is what I'm saying in Canberra in your name, this is what happened in the budget, this is what you're getting or not getting, or this is what I've done, et cetera, et cetera, that if people weren't satisfied with that representation, then they could have a recall election and bring them back in and elect someone else. So that accountability was, yeah, really, really prominent. Um, but, but it would be dealt with in legislation. Um, the second question. The second question was about the sort of state of governance itself, which is sort of separate from the constitutional question, but will come flowing out of it if, if those bodies are part of the, the voice structure. Yeah, I mean, I don't wanna, I mean, I, I, think, I think that's a big job for government and the agency to determine what, what that looks like post this reform. Um, because I think it will radically transform a lot of the way people do business, but also those organisations. Um, I think there was a piece by Chris Kenny in The Australian, I think, that was really good, that kind of just said, I mean, of course it's going to change the landscape. Some organisations will stay and some will go, but um, that needs to be worked out um, with, with community in terms of design, because I suspect post a referendum you would need another kind of design period to talk to mob on the ground about what they think is required um, in that legislation and in that design. Um, and a lot of that, those matters will be picked up then. Because I remember we were, one of the things about the dialogues was we just couldn't believe how many issues were raised that are just <coughs> never reported in the mainstream press, like none. And just how we'd gone from, you know, decades ago where there was quite forensic reporting on Aboriginal affairs to now where um, it's not as forensic. And so, and so there are a lot of really complex issues on the ground, but um, ones that need to be yeah, dealt with in probably, well, I don't, I don't know when, but um, it's certainly, it is a, it's a restructure, right? It's a, it's a structural reform. So it will change the way things hap like happen and how business is done. Did you want to add anything there? I think the press has a, you have a really important job to do here um, and a responsibility um, as well. Sometimes a lot of the stories is one-sided. Um, often it's really clear the journalist really hasn't got a really good history background. Um, so you need to be a little bit more um, agile, a bit more energetic about getting to the truth um, of issues. And I have this romantic view, you see, of the role of the journalist, journalist in any society. It's your job to inform us and keep us informed and keep us on top of the issues of the, of the state uh, and how, how it's operated and all, this, all of its citizens. So I think there's a responsibility there for the journalist to do the best they can and to rise to this occasion because I think this is only going to happen in our lifetime. I hope it happens this time because I, don't want, oh, I won't be around. Um, we don't want to leave it to our grandchildren because we're not going away. Believe me, we've been here for over, the latest figure I read was 100,000 years. So we've been here a really long time. We ain't going nowhere. <laughs> so at some stage, you're all going to have to deal with us. So, and the journalists can help. The journalists have a really important role to play here. And I know there are lots of them today and, and we, we do respect you, but just got to do your job a bit harder. <laughs> a Ask. challenge for all of us, and uh, Lisa Vincent will now answer that challenge. <laughs> Take that on board. Um, Professor Davis, you spoke really powerfully about, uh, I guess, just the, the, the sheer amount of hope that so many Indigenous Australians have vested in the outcome of this referendum and that it is a success. Um, so can I ask for your reflections on, I guess, just the magnitude of what is at stake here? We all know how extraordinarily difficult it is to get constitutional change in this country. Um, so I guess to your mind, what is the potential consequence of failure here? What impact would that have on the relationship between Indigenous and, and non-Indigenous Australians? And I guess what would, what would rejection of the voice say about Australia? Um. <laughs> We, there's, this, there's been this thing in our campaign since we issued the Uluru Statement from the Heart, and that is every time someone said no, we've just pretended it was a yes. <laughs> um, and so, so 
from Turnbull yeah. to Morrison, we'd be like, oh, that was like, no. Um, no, it's a yes, it's a yes. <laughs> um, so we kind of have always operated in that way. Mm. Um, our mind frame is one that we don't contemplate failure. Um, so I know it's a favourite question of the, of the press to ask about failure and what will happen and um, what it means for race relations. I mean, my response would probably be look at race relations now. Um, and I'm not sure um, in, in some of the things that we're seeing currently in the press that, you know, um, it could go any lower. Um, I can, I, I don't see this as failing. We can't because you don't participate in law reform by thinking you're not going to, it's not going to happen. I mean, I'm a constitutional lawyer who's worked in the space for 20 years, so I'm well aware of the record. I've taught it for 20, 20 years, eight out of 44. Everybody quotes it to me. People come up to me all the time now and say, do you know? And I think <laughs> um, so we, we know. Um, so when we did the dialogues, though, it, you know, it wasn't just, oh, we're going to a referendum, what do you want? We, we, mm. we talked about, do we want to go to a referendum? Um, but as I said, and as Pat knows and others in the room, there was a really strong confidence among our old people that they that this was easy. Um, I don't mean it like that's flippant, but that that this could be done because they had done it, yes. and they talked about how they do, they did it. Um, and we do talk about Pat's not over relying too much on social media and digital media to to get this done. That in fact this is a relational thing between Australians and our people and that it's going to require um, a lot of feet on the ground like our people did in the 1967 referendum. So, I mean, yes, like anyone in a law reform pro uh, process, I, I'm awake most nights thinking about it. I, my team knows I don't get much sleep. Um, so I think about it, but it's not something... I don't think you can do this kind of project going into it thinking that it's going to fail. Um, do you want to add something? No, no. Yeah, I think, I, think, um, I think our people, I mean, you know, I think generally people see it as a, um, you know, one of many structural forms that need to be made to improve um, the situation in terms of structural powerlessness. Um, so it's not, it's not the be all and end all, but it is the most significant thing that you can do in a, in a, in a system to change because it's the constitution. So it anchors this particular voice in the constitution. You can't get anything stronger, um, which is why we're going for it. Thank you. Now we are up against the, the clock. We've got Sarah Eisen next. Sarah Eisen from The Australian. Uh, members of the coalition, including Peter Dutton, have right, made remarks that do align them with voice critics, including accusing the government of m making up detail on the run, saying the government should fund both a yes and a no campaign, etc. How concerned are you about the impact on a yes vote if the coalition doesn't necessarily outright campaign no, but continues to raise concerns, continues to say all of these things right up until a referendum? How how significant is that? Mm. Um, I think I think two things. What is that's in some ways the job of an opposition um, is to raise these questions and questions about detail, etc. Perfectly legitimate questions. Um, I think on the bipartisanship question, I think. There is that calculation that people make that, you know, eight out of 44 had bipartisanship um, and therefore you must have bipartisanship, although four of those questions were at one referendum and one didn't have bipartisanship. So it's quite a lower um, threshold. Um, but, but the last referendum was 40 years ago when we had no social media, it was all newspaper. Um, and who knows what a radical impact social media is going to have on the discourse. So I don't, I don't know about the yes, no cases. I don't know where that's headed. But we are, I mean, our job is as First Nations peoples with the Uluru Dialogue, with the leaders that were at, that, at the Rock and we've worked on this for five years. Our job is to keep talking to the Australian people about what it is, what it accurately is, what we're seeking to do. And um, I guess leave the politics for... Um, for the politicians um, because 
the whole point of the Uluru Statement was to get Australians to help us to push the politicians because of the policy and legal inertia that you get in Australia on big issues that Australians actually want change. That was the last election, right? That was a very clear indication from the Australian people that they wanted action on corruption and integrity, on climate change in Uluru. So um, that's, why the, that's why we issued it to Australians. So um, I think having Peter Dutton on board is an, it would be a good thing. Um, but, but I don't think we're there yet. Um, there's no date for the referendum. I think people are impatient for detail right now or impatient for him to make a decision now. Um, but I think, you know, we've, we've, right, we've been on this journey for five years and we know that every day changes and um, we just take one day at a time. So, um, you know, I think, um, I think they'll, come, they'll come around to it in their, um, in their time. But I have to say in the work that we've done lobbying, um, there, we have, there's, there's strong support from members of the LNP. Um, so we'll wait to see how it goes. Uh, I don't do know, do you, you want to add anything? It can, it can pass with, without bipartisan support. Do you think we could still achieve a yes vote? Um, we're not there yet. Like this is a live law reform process. So it's really difficult to just make judgments like that and speculate. You just can't. Every day is different. And we'll wait to see when, when the bill is prepared and there's probably going to have, there'll be conversations before. There, there's a lot to run. It's November. And so there's, there's a lot to run before now in a referendum bill, yeah. Our final question comes from Tom McElroy. Thank you for your speech. Uh, Professor Davis and um, Ms Anderson, you were architects of the question that the Prime Minister released at the Gama Festival in July. Um, it was posed as a draft question. Do you expect that there will be changes to it? Is, uh, have you received feedback that it could be changed? Uh, the Prime Minister and the Minister have been really clear that it is a draft, so presumably it'll change. Um, so it's been put out for comment and presumably people will comment. Um, the AG has set up a group, an academic group of lawyers to look at it that, um, that I'm also on. Um, but, I mean, the, the Law Council's over there. There's also a process um, in which the Law Council, in which the Indigenous Law Centre so our team of constitutional lawyers um, have gone out to consult with practitioners, so not academic constitutional lawyers, but those people who are on their feet in front of the High Court, specialising in constitutional law, that um, we've, we've partnered with the Law Council and the Australian Association of Constitutional Law, where we've been consulting with barristers who specialise in this space. And, um, and then that report will come out, I don't know, in, two, four weeks. I, I don't, honestly don't know. But so there's, there's a lot of work going on around that. The, the draft that you're referring to, though, had been produced over a five year period um, with about 30 to 50 odd lawyers at different times from across the political spectrum and mostly academic lawyers where we'd Zoom and draft and argue and fight. And so it, it's been the subject of a lot of kind of debate and discussion in the legal profession already. But, um, but it's, it's open. It's open to everyone to, to contribute to. There's lots of lawyers in the Oz and other places um, suggesting other alternative drafting and other issues. So, so it's, a, it's a live kind of law reform process right now. So, yeah. Thank you. More to come. Now, did you want to add anything, Pat? No, I'm gone. Thank you. Well, we do have something to add, a very exciting uh, special performance from Josephine Mick, uh, who's come from AP Wildlands and will be performing at the press club to close out this discussion today at, at the end of our address. You could tell people who will be staying in the uh, mum is, I'm Sally Scales by the way, mum is just saying that she's very happy to be here with everyone and um, just to bring a little bit of animal culture to Canberra and to this room um, and also she's going to do two songs, um, you might want to get your tissues ready for the second one. <laughs>
So that one was brought over, so it was, uh, so Indigenous um, rangers had gone over to Canada and came back with the beat from the Pow Pow and then the translation is Uluru is yours, Uluru is mine, it's all of ours and it's same with the Uluru uh, statement from the heart. And then this second one is a song that is was made round the conservation of black-footed wallabies in Central Australia. Um, and during that process, the backfooted wallabies, the mothers who were in the hills, started squealing and crying for their babies that were taken away. And during this process, the women who were part of the ranger program realised it's the same conversation we have for the removal of our children from our communities, and that's continued to happen, um, even though there was, sorry, said in 2007. So it's a very emotional song. Mm. I don't know about that one. So that literally says that the babies were gone and we're crying for them. Wow. Well, on that incredibly powerful note, thank you so much, Josephine. Mick, please also thank Professor Megan Davis and Pat Anderson AO for the being here and sharing with us today. There's, of course, one more thing to do, which is to share a membership for the Press Club with both of you. Uh, thank you so much for your time. One of these thank each you. get you into the building and uh, oh. access all areas, I'm told. <laughs> <laughs> so once again, please let's uh, thank everybody who's uh, given up their time today to speak to us. And thank you.